Today's episode will touch on sensitive topics, such as child death. So if you are sensitive to this content, please listen at your own discretion. What is art without the muse? Many of Western art's most famous works are depictions of women. But who were these women? Do they have their own stories to share with the world? Hello and welcome to Art Muse, a podcast that aims to reshape the ways in which we interpret well-known works of art by paying dues to the women whose images have been immortalized, but whose names and stories have been wrongfully overlooked. While these women's faces are familiar to viewers around the world, their identities have been largely forgotten. Together we will explore the important lives and legacy of the female muse and appreciate these works of art from a new perspective, through the eyes of the women whose image stares back at us. Is the muse in actuality just as, if not more, important than the artists themselves? And I'm your host, Grace Anna. Welcome to part two of our episode on Lisa Gerardini, a.k.a. the Mona Lisa. In part one, we were introduced to Lisa's story, her challenging upbringing, her marriage that defied all odds, and the fortuitous and mysterious circumstances that led to Leonardo's creation of Lisa's portrait. Today, we will continue Lisa's story and together examine the Mona Lisa from a new perspective, through the eyes of Lisa Gerardini. We pick back up on Lisa's story after Leonardo's and subsequently her portrait's departure from Florence in 1506. How did Lisa evolve after having to part from her beloved portrait? Just a year later, Lisa gave birth to her third son, Giacondo del Giacondo. Unfortunately, Giacondo only survived a month before he passed away. He would be the second child of Lisa's lost to premature death. Giacondo would also be the last child Lisa ever was to birth. Perhaps Lisa's heart couldn't bear the chance of another devastating loss, instead focusing on the nourishment of her surviving children. Unfortunately, Giacondo's death would not be the last of Lisa's children to die in her lifetime, a tragedy Lisa could not escape. A few years later, Lisa and Francesco decided to send their eldest daughter, Camilla, to a convent located just outside the city walls. Most young women were sent to convents if they could not secure a fruitful marriage but Camilla was likely not in this category. Francesco had already put aside ample funds for her dowry, and with powerful connections, he would have guaranteed a suitable husband for Camilla. And at the age of 12, Camilla would have been far too young to have given up on the prospect of marriage. Rather, the decision likely stemmed more from Lisa than Francesco. After mourning the loss of two of her children, might Lisa have pushed for Camilla to join the convent to keep her eldest daughter safe? If you recall from part one, Camilla was the daughter born just after the death of her first daughter, Piera, and Lisa may have felt especially protective of her. Might she have hoped living a pious life would spare her daughter from life's malices? Lisa was likely extra comforted by the fact that two of her sisters were also nuns at the convent. Lisa must have asked that her sisters look after Camilla to ensure that she was well taken care of. Little did Lisa know that just a year after Camilla's entry into the convent, Lisa's sister would be involved in one of Florence's hottest scandals. On April 20th, 1512, a manager of the convent's property let three male friends into the nunnery at night. According to a first-hand account, four men with weapons and a ladder went to the convent of San Domenico, and after climbing the wall up to certain windows where two nuns were waiting for them, remained there for three or four hours. 
they touched the breasts of said nuns and handled other things for the sake of not detailing the obscenities committed. One of these nuns was Lisa's younger sister. The manager of the property and his three friends were arrested to be charged with the sentencing and fine. The nuns were acquitted, but still faced great disgrace. Whether Lisa's sister was forced into engaging with the intruders or not, her reputation was shattered and Lisa's family name tarnished. This would have not only been deeply humiliating for Lisa, but also concerning that her precious daughter, only at the age of 12, was under the watch of such a scandalous sister. The same year would bring more concern. After the Medici were forced to flee by the Spanish, Spanish troops marched into Florence and cracked down on Medici supporters. Francesco, who had always had a working relationship with the Medicis, was arrested in late August. Only a few weeks after the scandal at the nunnery, Lisa had continuous reason to worry. Her husband's imprisonment and the city's precarious state must have been greatly upsetting. Fortunately for both Francesco and Lisa, the Medici were reinstated into power shortly after. Francesco was not only released from prison, but won the good graces of the Medici family, who welcomed Francesco into their new governing body. That following spring, Francesco served a two-month term in the highest of offices as a prior of the Signoria. After such a tumultuous year, Lisa must have rejoiced over Francesco's new position of power returning both safety and honor to her and her family. But this power did not come without a price. The young grandson of Lorenzo the Magnificent, also named Lorenzo, was left in charge of Florence's rule. Curiously, the young Lorenzo and his brother-in-law, Filippo Strozzi, wrote of their lust for Lisa. In a letter to Lorenzo from 1515, Filippo talked of the two men trying to, quote, tempt the honor of Lisa. Lisa, who was much older, but clearly still a woman of great desire, rejected the two men's advances. The ordeal left Francesco in a difficult position. On the one hand, he was disrespected by Lorenzo and Filippo, but he also now had concerns that this might create a strife between him and the Medici. Stuck between a rock and a hard place, Francesco unfortunately had to apologize to the young men for Lisa's refusal of them and begged to stay in their good graces. While they accepted Francesco's apologies, the letter painted Francesco out to be the butt of a joke, as his attempt to remedy the situation doubled his humiliation we can imagine that Lisa was also doubly humiliated, disrespected by both the two young men and also Francesco. It is safe to assume that this may have caused some strain in Lisa's marriage. As we will later see, this won't be the only curious tie between Lisa and the Medici that we will uncover. And the young Lorenzo, may have not been the only Medici to desire the beautiful Lisa Gerardini. Three years later, tragedy struck once again. At the age of 18, Lisa's beloved daughter Camilla passed away at the convent from an illness. This must have been incomprehensibly devastating for Lisa, who had petitioned for Camilla to enter the nunnery to keep her safe and protected. After 18 years, Lisa inevitably had a deep and growing relationship with Camilla, not just as mother and daughter, but woman to woman. At the age of 38, Lisa had buried three of her six children. Soon after Camilla's death, Lisa made the decision to send her only surviving daughter, Marietta, to another nunnery named St. Ursula. Lisa herself often visited the convent of St. Ursula and supported it through donations throughout her life. 
After Camilla's death, Lisa is recorded as visiting St. Ursula more often. Might Lisa have pushed for Marietta to join the nunnery as an act of piety, an offering to God out of respect for the recently deceased Camilla? Might she have found comfort in the convent during her time of great pain and mourning? Might she, in the most testing of times, have formed an unbreakable faith? The convent of St. Ursula was one of Florence's most highly respected convents. Having a daughter accepted into St. Ursula often required status, as well as a large sum of money. Families would make an initial payment, as well as provide extra money for meals and daily needs. If enough money was paid, a family could make a special request, ensuring that their daughter lived a comfortable life at the convent. The record of Lisa's financial agreement with the convent still exists today, signed by Lisa in 1519. The payment secured Marietta agreeable conditions. As the only surviving daughter left, Marietta's safety and future must have been of top priority to Lisa. And after Marietta's admittance into the nunnery, Lisa enjoyed a period of peace and security. Her surviving children were all carving their paths to a prosperous and healthy adulthood. In 1510, Francesco sold his shares in the Del Giacondo workshop and instead formed a new partnership with his sons, Bortolomeo and Piero. Andrea, Lisa's second son, became involved in the company's international trade and eventually left Florence for Antwerp, where he founded his own branch. And after a few years, Marietta officially took the veil and became a nun at the convent. But in 1526, when Lisa was 47 years old, her father, Anton Maria, passed away. Anton Maria left behind a significant debt, never recovering from the financial troubles of Lisa's childhood. More than half of his assets needed to be sold to pay off his creditors. Also left behind were Lisa's siblings, who were not as fortunate as Lisa, and never left Anton Maria's home. Francesco, at the request of Lisa, agreed to move Lisa's siblings into the home next door to them, which Francesco had purchased as an investment. Knowing what we know of Francesco, this act speaks volumes to how much he cared for Lisa, sacrificing the income from his home to please his beloved wife. Luckily for Francesco, he would have many other real estate ventures to make up for this act of generosity. Later in life, Francesco switched his focus to agriculture and land ownership. He invested in various rural properties in the Chianti region, and he continued to meticulously plan for his children's future up until the end of his life. A year before his death, Francesco drew up the final and most important plan, his will. Francesco prepared his will in 1537. It survives in its entirety today and is an incredible insight into his character as well as his love for Lisa. The will's most telling and fascinating parts are those that concern Lisa. To start, Francesco returned Lisa's dowry to her, as well as her expensive jewels and clothing, not a given in wills of the time. This act was a clear gesture of both respect and devotion towards Lisa. And it wasn't just these generous acts that attest to Francesco's unique love for his wife, but the language he used to express them. The language of his will is the only direct source we have attesting to the loving relationship between Lisa and Francesco. Francesco refers to Lisa as his, quote, beloved wife, and returns her belongings to her, quote, from affection and mutual love. The most striking section of the will reads, quote, Given the affection and love of the testator, Francesco, towards Mona Lisa, his beloved wife, in consideration of the fact that Lisa has always acted with a noble spirit and as a faithful wife, 
wishing that she shall have all that she needs. Many scholars have noted how rare Francesca's wording was, particularly in describing Lisa as having a noble spirit. While wills of the time often referred to their wives as honest Moliere, virtuous wife, Francesco used the term Moliere in Jena. Though most scholars translate this as noble spirit, if translated literally, the term actually means free woman. Francesco's unique wording evokes a sense of Lisa as an independent woman of integrity. The will may be the truest tribute to the essence of who Lisa was, a wife respected by her husband as an independent woman of her own right. But we could expect nothing less, for who else could produce a smile like Mona Lisa's but the noblest of spirits? In the rest of the will, Francesco trusted Marietta with the care of Lisa and asked that his sons respect Marietta's agency over Lisa's care. He clearly had much respect for mother and daughter, making sure that they were both provided for and protected. Francesco ended his will with the plea for his family to maintain peace through the process of Francesco's inheritance. He died a year later at the age of 73 leaving behind Lisa, Bortolomeo, Piero, and Marietta. By all accounts, the family upheld Francesco's parting wish and honored his will amiably. Lisa was 60 years old at the time of Francesco's death. Exercising some of her newfound agency, she decided to give her dowry and the possessions inherited by Francesco to Marietta a testament to Lisa's love for her one surviving daughter. And while it would have been expected for her to live out the rest of her life with her son Piero, in the home she had shared with Francesco for almost 50 years, she soon after decided to relocate to St. Ursula to be with Marietta. It is here that Lisa spent her final years, at the convent with Marietta. Francesco may have known that Lisa wanted to spend her final years at St. Ursula, which could account for his decision to place Marietta in charge of Lisa's care. This wouldn't have been largely unusual, as it was customary for convents to accommodate widows in their elder age. But we can also imagine that Lisa wanted to be close to her daughter, and that her love for Marietta played a significant part in her decision to move to St. Ursula and Lisa's decision may have also been in part a reflection of her own piety, her desire to live amongst women of faith in a place she had supported throughout her life. And so, Lisa lived at the convent of St. Ursula for the next four years, until she died on July 14, 1542, at the age of 63. Her death was mysteriously not recorded in the city's Libri de Morti, or in any family documents. We get information on Lisa's death from the priests of San Lorenzo, who had known Lisa as a devout attendee throughout her life. The priests recorded her passing with the entry, Mona Lisa was the wife of Francesco del Giocondo. She died on 15 July 1542 and was buried in St. Ursula. Her funeral was attended by all members of this chapter. This seems to indicate that Lisa's funeral was held in the Church of San Lorenzo, which would have had room for a large congregation. We can picture a room filled with Lisa's loved ones, her children whom she had devoted so much of her life to caring for, her children's now growing families, the nuns of St. Ursula, the priests she had known from San Lorenzo and Santissima Annunziata, and the many important people of Florence whose lives she had touched. The fact that the priests noted that all members of their chapter were present is not to be overlooked. It was a unique gesture of respect for Lisa, and a true reflection of the dignity 
with which Lisa lived out her life. As the priest described, Lisa was buried at St. Ursula, which is one of the most striking moments of her story. Instead of being buried in Santissima Annunziata with Francesco, as was his wish, Lisa made the surprising choice to be buried at the nunnery. Could this have been a deliberate choice to separate herself from her husband? Considering what we know of their marriage, this would have been somehow puzzling. Was Lisa, liberated by Francesco's death, sending a message about the true nature of their relationship? Or could Lisa's decision have been one of devotion to God and her faith? While we may never know the answer, I like to think of Lisa's defiant burial when I admire her mysterious smile. One final secret that Lisa took to the grave, quite literally. So what came of Lisa and Francesco's children and legacy? Marietta lived out her life at the convent as a highly respected nun. Bortolomeo and Piero, who inherited Francesco's fabric business, proved to be much less savvy than Francesco, and the business slowly declined. They lost many of the company's important clientele and were eventually forced to sell many of their real estate properties to stay afloat, including the main family home where Lisa had lived. In all fairness, the economic conditions of Florence were far less favorable than they had been in Francesco's time. Nonetheless, by the time Bortolomeo and Piero died, in 1561 and 1569 respectively, the Del Giocondo business was a far cry from its glory days. Both sons were buried with their father in the family crypt at Santissima Annunziata. Bortolomeo's son, who would have been Lisa's grandson, Gaspare, inherited the now-failing Del Giocondo business. Unfortunately for the Del Giocondo legacy, Gaspari was certainly not up for the task of rebuilding the family's lost empire. A reckless gambler, Gaspari declared himself bankrupt just three years after his father's death. A judge ruled that Gaspari's belongings be confiscated and auctioned off, not only putting an end to Gaspari's career as a merchant, but bringing great shame to the Del Giocondo name. Gaspari was eventually employed as a scribe by the friars of Santissima Annunziata, who agreed to the arrangement out of respect for Francesco, and Lisa and Francesco's home was auctioned off to raise money for orphans, an act of charity we can imagine Lisa would have approved of. And as Lisa's life and the next generations died out, her legacy lives on in her portrait a portrait Lisa herself never owned in her lifetime, a portrait which also lived and continues to live a long and fruitful life after its parting from Lisa, a portrait that grew and transformed with Lisa despite their distance. So what of the portrait's journey after its departure from Florence? It is evident that the portrait of Lisa Gerardini underwent changes and development over time. The painting does not have continuous documentation, but we can piece together its journey for the most part. In part one of this episode, I mentioned the discovery of a document that made Lisa Gerardini as the subject of the Mona Lisa indisputable. The document is a text of Cicero's Letter to His Friends, annotated by Machiavelli's clerk, Augustino. Along its margins, Augustino wrote, This is what Leonardo da Vinci does in all his pictures, as in the head of Lisa del Giocondo. This annotation, dated 1503, is the same year we know Leonardo began the Mona Lisa. With this finding, we can say with certainty that the painting was in the works by October of 1503 and was for sure a portrait of Lisa. As the clerk of Machiavelli, who worked directly with Leonardo, Agostino would have had direct information regarding Leonardo and his work. 
and his annotation is an extremely reliable source. Agostino was referring to the fact that Leonardo rarely finishes his works. It must have been apparent early on that Leonardo was struggling to finish his portrait of Lisa. After working in Florence for a few years and amassing even more failures under his belt, we know that Leonardo returned to Milan in 1506 and that he brought the painting with him. Leonardo remained in Milan for seven years. The Florentine government petitioned time and time again for Leonardo to return to Florence and complete his unfinished projects, but Leonardo never did so and remained in Milan until 1513. Unfortunately, Leonardo, for the second time in his life, had to leave Milan due to the rulership being overthrown. In 1513, Leonardo made his way to Rome with Lisa's portrait, to be taken under the wings of the Medici. Leonardo spent the next three years here in Rome, during which time, Giuliano Medici became Leonardo's primary patron. It is here where the painting story gets juicy. Giuliano Medici had worked firsthand with Francesco in the Florentine government shortly before coming to Rome and meeting Leonardo. During his time in Florence, Giuliano and Francesco must have developed personal relations. Could Francesco have introduced Giuliano to Lisa? Might Lisa have caught the eye of yet another Medici? As Leonardo's patron, we can safely assume that he would have been shown Leonardo's portrait of Lisa. Could Giuliano have recognized Lisa and wanted the portrait for himself? Or might Giuliano have commissioned Leonardo to make changes to the portrait to fit his own visions. The possibility that Leonardo made changes to the portrait under the direction of Giuliano Medici is supported by a primary document from 1517, just after Leonardo's time in Rome. In 1516, Leonardo moved from Rome to France to work for King Francis I. Once again, we know that Leonardo brought the Mona Lisa with him. The following year, the Cardinal of Aragon visited France. His secretary, a man named Antonio de Betis, kept a thorough travel diary throughout the trip. One of his journal entries described the group's meeting of Leonardo da Vinci. As Antonio wrote, our master went with the rest of us to one of the precincts to see Messer Leonardo da Vinci, an old man of more than 70, the most outstanding painter of our age. He showed to His Excellency three pictures, one of a certain Florentine woman portrayed from life at the behest of the late magnificent Giuliano de' Medici. Antonio's observations have been a huge point of contention for historians trying to make sense of Antonio's claim that Giuliano de' Medici commissioned the work. There have been various theories proposed in an attempt to explain this discrepancy. Some have questioned if Lisa might have been Giuliano's secret lover. There is the possibility that Giuliano and Lisa's paths crossed in Florence, but it is highly unlikely that Giuliano would have commissioned a painting of Lisa. Others have proposed that Giuliano may have asked Leonardo to paint a portrait of his lost wife over the portrait of Lisa, but this is also unlikely. In my opinion, the most convincing theory is that Giuliano, aware that the painting was unfinished and impressed by its unique beauty, may have asked Leonardo to turn the portrait into a representation or allegory of female beauty. The last circulating theory is the possibility of two portraits. Some have speculated that Leonardo painted a second version for Giuliano, and that it is this version that now hangs at the Louvre. Might there be a possibility that Leonardo did not leave Florence with the portrait after all? 
could he have given a first version of the portrait to Francesco, which has since been lost? Was there a second portrait made for Giuliano, inspired by Lisa, but of a more abstracted subject? Through the years, there have been discoveries of other versions of the Mona Lisa, which have been argued are this first version that may have remained in Florence. The most famous of these discoveries is dubbed the Isleworth Mona Lisa. Those defending its authenticity argue that Leonardo made multiple versions of other paintings, and that Raphael's drawing more closely resembles the Isleworth version. The crux of their reasoning, however, comes from Antonio's diary entry. And while the idea that Leonardo made an earlier version, a direct portrait of Lisa, is tempting, most scholars deny that the Isleworth Mona Lisa was made by Leonardo's hand. And in fact, scholars have questioned the credibility of Antonio's diary entry. Antonio was a secretary and likely not at the front of Leonardo's presentation. It is quite possible he may have misheard Leonardo. Antonio also wrote that Leonardo had, quote, suffered from paralysis in his right hand, which had stopped Leonardo from working. Yet we know that Leonardo was left-handed, and he claimed Leonardo to be over 70 when he was in fact only 67. These inconsistencies make Antonio's words less reliable. There is also the possibility that Leonardo himself may have falsely claimed Giuliano commissioned the work to capture the attention of his audience, or that Leonardo, in his old age and after a possible stroke, was himself misremembering. There are no other primary sources supporting that it was Giuliano Medici who commissioned the Mona Lisa. All other primary sources indicate that it was indeed commissioned by Francesco. The most important of these is Vasari. Vasari explicitly stated that the portrait was for Francesco and that this same portrait ended up in France. Vasari lived in Florence while Francesco and Lisa were still alive and quite possibly knew them personally. Vasari was even Lisa's eldest daughter Piero's neighbor for a period of time. Vasari had direct access to Lisa and her family, who could have easily corrected him. Vasari even released a second version of his book that accounted for any errors made in the first. But the section on Mona Lisa is largely unchanged in the second version. Most scholars strongly believe that there is only one version of the Mona Lisa which was transformed over time as Leonardo experimented with the painting throughout his life. Despite it being a commissioned work, Leonardo poured so much of his own soul, his life's purpose, into the painting. The portrait of Lisa evolved into not just a reflection of Lisa's spirit, but also of Leonardo's own psyche. As Professor Jeffrey Ruda so eloquently wrote, Leonardo saw that he could use the painting to demonstrate everything he had learned about portraiture and to convey everything he understood about being human. The portrait of Lisa became something of Leonardo's own. Their spirits intertwined and her image transformed into a universal symbol of the deep and timeless mystery of all it is to be human. Leonardo kept the portrait with him until he died in 1519, at the age of 67. After Leonardo's death, the painting seems to have been transferred into the possession of his pupil, Salai, until Salai's death in 1524. King Francis I of France is recorded as purchasing the Mona Lisa in 1525 and hanging the painting in his private quarters at Fontainebleau. The painting has remained in France ever since. Lisa was 46 years old when her portrait landed in the King of France's private collection and would live another 17 years. Did Lisa know that her portrait was in the French royal collection in her lifetime? In 1550, Vasari noted in the lives of the artist that the portrait was at Fontainebleau, 
but it is unclear if this was known in 1542 when Lisa died. That her portrait traveled from Florence to Milan, later to Rome, and finally to France, all in Lisa's lifetime, is quite remarkable. Its physical journey as vast as its compositional transformation. Recent technology has opened exciting new insights into the Mona Lisa's compositional changes over time. Specialists have analyzed the Mona Lisa using infrared examination, X-ray emission, and multispectral scanning. One of the most exciting discoveries was conducted in 2004 by Pascal Cote, an optical engineer at Lumiere Technology based in Paris. Cote pioneered a form of multispectral scanning called LAM, Layer Amplification Method. As the name suggests, Cote's technique reveals the many layers of paint beneath the painted surface, which tells the story of the painting's development. Cote claims that his specific technique allows for a deeper penetration into the painting than other previously employed techniques. He analyzed his findings for over a decade before publishing his work in the Journal of Cultural Heritage in 2020. Cote found evidence that Leonardo used the Splovero technique when drafting the Mona Lisa, a technique in which the artist transfers preparatory sketches onto the panel by pricking tiny holes along the outlines of the drawing. This confirms that Leonardo depended on a preparatory drawing in the rendering of Lisa's portrait and opens the possibility that this drawing may one day be discovered. If this were true, then it's possible that this drawing may have been used to create copies of the painting, such as the controversial Isleworth version. Locating the original Splovero markings, Colt was able to create a rendering of what the initial portrait may have looked like. The rendering shows us a slightly different pose, with Mona Lisa's face turned more towards the right. Her eyes look off to the side rather than directly at the viewer. Her face is slightly more narrow than in the final version. One of the most mysterious details of the Mona Lisa as it is today is the absence of eyebrows and eyelashes, and yet Coates' rendering reveals a face with both, suggesting that they may have just faded with time. In the early rendering created by Cote, Lisa's mouth is smaller, and her smile is not yet fully formed. Her hair is fashioned in a headdress with long, straight hair falling behind her shoulders. These details are reminiscent of Raphael's sketch, presumably of the same earlier version of the Mona Lisa. They work together to give us a sense of not only what the portrait may have looked like as Lisa knew it, but of Lisa herself. If you look at a side-to-side -side of Coates rendering with Raphael's sketch, the similarities are quite remarkable. Coates' findings support the notion that the portrait went through a process of continuous evolution, rather than there being multiple paintings. So let's look at the final version of the Mona Lisa, bearing in mind both the painting and Lisa's long-life journeys. To viewers today, the Mona Lisa may seem small, but the portrait was quite large by Renaissance standards, and Lisa's head is actually life-size. Lisa is seated with her hands folded, facing the viewer at a three-quarter angle. Leonardo broke Renaissance convention by presenting Lisa in a three-quarter view rather than in profile, as well as including her entire torso as most portraits cut off just below the shoulder. Both pictorial decisions give Lisa a powerful presence that many female Renaissance subjects lacked. Although we know Lisa was a wealthy woman, the Mona Lisa does not wear any jewelry. Her clothing also lacks the ornateness of a Renaissance lady, let alone one married to Florence's leading fabric manufacturer. This gives Lisa a sense of humbleness and approachability, as well as ambiguity. She is seated in an equally ambiguous background, a luscious hillside with paths to deep water that twirl and dance with one another amidst a hazed green sky. 
But of course, it is Lisa's face that has garnered the most attention. For this, I'd like to share an abbreviated excerpt of Vasari's description of the Mona Lisa. In this head, anyone who wishes to see how closely art could imitate nature may comprehend it with ease. For in it were counterfeited all those tiny things that only with subtlety can be painted. Seeing that the eyes had a luster and watery shine, which are always seen in life. In the pit of the throat, if one gazed upon it intently, one could see the beating of the pulses. And in this work of Leonardo's, there was a smile, so pleasing that it was a thing more divine than human to witness. And it was held to be something marvelous, since it was none other than alive. Vasari's description hits on why the Mona Lisa has become the world's most famous painting. Lisa is quite simply alive. Viewers watch her eyes follow their every move and pierce into the deepest parts of their soul. Her smile, full of knowingness, brings viewers face to face with the timeless realities of humanity. And despite her knowingness, the Mona Lisa herself cannot be known, an ethereal presence that eludes full understanding, even by experts. Scholars Martin Kemp and Giuseppe Palanti use the term enigmatic inaccessibility, which perfectly captures the essence of how the Mona Lisa has continued to mystify viewers through the centuries. My hope is that today's episode can give us new ways of appreciating and understanding the Mona Lisa through the life story of Lisa herself. When we look into the Mona Lisa's eyes, we see mirrored all that Lisa endured, her father's financial ruin, the untimely death of three of her six children, her husband's imprisonment, and Florence's continual rise and fall in power. It is not just Leonardo's immense talent as a painter, but Lisa's emotional depth as a sitter that gives the Mona Lisa's eyes the unspoken understanding of the deepest pains of being alive. When we look at Lisa's smile, we can think of Lisa's joy. The victory of her marriage against all odds the treasured experience of being a mother, and her noble spirit that not only turned a business shark like Francesco Soft and drew all the saints of San Lorenzo to her funeral, but left such an impression on Leonardo that he couldn't part with her face for the rest of his life. The mystery of the Mona Lisa's smile is just as mysterious as Lisa's last decision to defy Francesco's wishes and be buried at St. Ursula, rather than by her husband's side. As she smiles at us, she knows the mysteries of her life are just as great as the painting itself, that in the end it is Lisa who decides what we do or do not know, as the master of her own fate. Despite the Mona Lisa being one of, if not the most famous work in the world, Lisa Gerardini's legacy has been unfairly overlooked. So how is Lisa honored today? Recently, Lisa's childhood neighborhood in the Altrano district of Florence has launched Mona Lisa Day on Lisa's birthday. A plaque has been placed on the house Lisa was born in on Via Squaza, and there is a campaign to restore the abandoned convent of St. Ursula, where Lisa is buried. But one of the most remarkable ways in which Lisa's legacy has lived on, quite literally, is in her bloodline. Recently, two sisters of the ancient Struzzi family have come forward as living descendants of Lisa Gerardini. Natalia and Irina Struzzi are 15 generations removed from Lisa, but are in fact confirmed descendants. There are pictures of Natalia and Arena proudly standing in front of the Mona Lisa. It's beautiful to see the sisters alongside Lisa 
and know that Lisa's blood runs through their veins. This podcast is another form of the continuation of Lisa Gerardini's legacy. The next time you see an image of the Mona Lisa, think of Lisa Gerardini as a real woman of history whose story deserves to be shared with the world. I hope you have enjoyed this two-part episode on Lisa Gerardini. I've included images, resources, and suggestions for further reading on the Art Muse website and Instagram. Art Muse is produced by Kula Production Company. Today's episode was written and recorded by me, your host, Grace Anna. Stay tuned as I continue to share the stories of the women behind some of the world's most important works of art. Until next time, bye for now.